Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Joint Venture Marketing Mastery. I'm Andy Anderson. Thank you so much for joining us for this really incredible event. We have been talking to some really incredible entrepreneurs during this event. They're sharing their proven systems, strategies to building a profitable business, utilizing the power of joint ventures. And in this session, we're going to dive into the topic of accelerated list building, as well as a lot of other great ideas. And the person here to dive into this topic with us is Chris Van Buren. Hi, Chris. Hi, Andy. It's great to have you here. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. I want to tell everyone a little bit about you and what you're up to in the world. So Chris has worked in the publishing and online marketing fields for over 25 years as an author, an editor, publisher, marketing director, campaign manager, you name it. He is an expert in content marketing, affiliate marketing, and online direct marketing strategies. And he was also the VP of technology for a boutique online ad network in the conscious consumer niche. Chris has written over 15 books in the technology, travel, and self-help markets, and he spent eight years as a literary agent helping authors get their books published. He is also the president and founder of Launch Moxie, Inc., which supports authors and entrepreneur, entrepreneurs by providing services that help build their marketing platforms, mailing lists, and information product offerings. And that is, Launch Moxie is actually the way we originally got connected, Chris, years ago. So, you know, given that the topic today of your talk is accelerated list building, how does list building go hand in hand with joint venture marketing? Like how do these two things um, unite to help an entrepreneur build a business? Well, most joint venture marketing um, is email marketing. It's just, that's just a fact. Um, uh, joint, joint venture marketing doesn't tend to be, it can be, but it doesn't tend to be exchanging um, Facebook posts or exchanging um, uh, banner ads on your website. Um, that used to happen like 20 years ago. There used to be things called uh, banner networks, banner exchange networks. Um, they fizzled out. It didn't really work that well. Um, but this sort of new JV market that's happening, JV model that's happening, um, does work and it's completely replaced that old model and it's 90% email based. So one party sends an email out to their list, the other party sends an email out to, to their list. Um, it's email exchange. So list building is becomes, you know, the most important sort of part of it, the, the backbone of joint venture marketing. And in, in a sense, the backbone of, of building an online marketing program in the early phase is um, list building. Got it. Awesome. So could you tell us a little bit about like, how did you get involved in this? How did Launch Monks, Moxie Inc. begin? How did you, how did you get started with this? So we have a little background on, on your story. Yeah, I came from, uh, I'm going to skip, you know, the early, <laughs> skip way up till about uh, 2007. And I started working with an online ad network, uh, a traditional type network, which basically sells banner ads on other people's websites, which you call your publisher base. Uh, to the ad industry. And we were a traditional network, which means we went out to ad agencies all over the, the big agencies and we did our little, you know, dog and pony show and said, you should, you should buy advertising on our network. And we were a boutique network that sold specifically to Body, Mind, Spirit, which means our publishers were Body, Mind, Spirit websites. So we could provide advertising on those websites to their advertisers. Well, it it was a challenge because this is, you know, 2008, 2007. Mo at the time, most advertisers were looking for high volume, low price, you know, rock bottom pricing. And we had about 200 million, uh, what's called impressions that we were in our inventory that we were selling or you know, selling into. A uh, big ad network would have billions of impressions. So we were a tiny little network. And so we had to get really creative about how to attract the, the right kind of advertisers, sometimes directly and sometimes through an agency. And so we started doing all these different sort of content-based strategies. For example, um, we had a, I noticed at one point we had five or six um, small e echo fashion companies that were, we were talking to. None of them were advertising. And I was talking to the sales team. I said, how can we get these people to, to advertise. They don't have a lot of budget. They tend to be small. It's a very competitive market. And basically what we did is we created a content product that we called the virtual 
Echo Fashion Show. So we literally created our own fashion show online, a virtual fashion show, and, and attracted them in to become the show. Not advertisers in the show, but the show itself. And of course, it was pay to play, so it was advertising, but instead of putting a banner on somebody else's website, they were displaying their line in a fashion show. So that was just one example of sort of getting creative. And so when I left that business, um, long story short, uh, after a little while, I started Launch Moxie and put some of these creative content-based strategies to work, uh, which led into the joint venture model and um, list building, which is a great, great model, in the, especially in the body, mind, spirit world. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's been fun to reconnect with you because, gosh, it's been it's been many years. But I remember you you or one of your associates approached us years ago in the in our Avaya film world and and being able to connect on a free film promotion cross promotion and you know it's been fun to to see you grow over the years and and shift and change and us included and you know see where we see where we are today. <laughs> that's that's one of the that's that's the good news and the bad news of the of being in this industry. Um, sort of the online marketing industry or even the online industry at all um, is that uh, it changes all the time. You have to, you have to change every six months or so and update, rebuild, rethink um, for people that love this industry. That's the good news because um, <laughs> you love it. You know, you want to do it. You want to keep reinventing and innovating uh, for people that don't that find this a sort of necessary evil for running their business. Um, it's the bad news. And then you, hopefully you have somebody that finds it, you know, to be their thing that finds it the good news to, to work with you. <laughs> right. So, so that's a good, that leads me to something I hadn't even thought about asking you, but what's changing right now or what has been changing in like the joint venture world? What's, what's changing, what's shifting, what's evolving right now? Well, there's always cycles, um, cycles of cost benefit and information. I've seen cycles in the body, mind, spirit world, a Quite often, um, you know, since the 80s all the way through, they, it goes in waves or, you know, in breath, out breath, where for a while there'll be a boom in a way. And then there'll be a kind of a collapsing down where uh, con consumers will be a little more price conscious. We're right now in a price conscious time. Consumers are being a little more um, choosy about the content they purchase. They're looking at price more. There's a, there's a whole lot of content out there. There's a whole lot of competition out there. Um, we saw that happen three years ago in the online telesummit market, where before three years ago, there were only a handful of telesummits and, and three or four huge ones. Um, actually, only a couple of them are still around. There, some, of them, <laughs> some of them are not really even active anymore. And then sort of everybody caught on to the model and started doing it, and there became just you know, outrageous number of telesummits out there. And then it got harder and harder, you know, to, to make, to make that model work. Um, or I should say it, you, in order to make it work, you had to innovate. You had to, you had to do something different. You had to innovate or, or have a big structure infrastructure. And that's kind of what we're seeing a little bit in body, mind, spirit and in online marketing as well. Um, in general, in, online course content in general, really, almost all markets, you're seeing a little bit of a, of a condensing because there's so much content, a lot of competition, and people are looking around and saying, well, can I get this somewhere else? So that's, for some people that might, they might go, well, maybe I shouldn't do it, right? I should stay away from that, it's a bad time. Not true. Um, what it really means is you, you want to make sure you're innovating. You want to make sure you're standing out. So that, that's a, it's a call to action, really. It's, a, it's, a, it's an invitation to use your creative skills and not just follow the path of what, you know, the, the, the online marketing gurus tell you that they did. Because right. it changes every six months. It certainly does. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so what are your tips or strategies for people watching right now, the entrepreneurs watching right now who want to stand out? Like if we're talking, you know, email marketing and building more joint venture partnerships, how do we stand out in that way? Well, great question. Um, uh, it's a unique, I think it's probably a unique answer for each individual. Um, I'm not sure there's one single answer other than, um, 
one of the keys of creativity is breaking the rules um, or bending the rules. So um, if you just follow the course of what you're taught in the programs, um, the online marketing blueprints and programs, um, that's one thing. But if, if you're able to bend the rules a little, if you're able to stretch the boundaries a little, that's what creativity is all about. It's about um, doing something different, differently. Um, obviously, you need to test. You need to make sure it's working. <laughs> um, creativity for creativity's sake isn't necessarily going to make money. So uh, it's a combination. If it's, a, it's kind of almost like an art as, uh, as much as a science, uh, online marketing, because uh, and really, I have to say, the creative side quite often is the side that um, people neglect. They get into the science of it. They get into the, you know, what works and the testing and the A-B test and all these things and where do you put the video and how long and all these different technical things that people have tested year, years and years. And they miss the creative part, which is an absolutely necessary part. If, it's, if, if you're missing that, then you're not really projecting yourself. You know, you're not really projecting what, what is sincere that people will really respond to. Um, I like to say that there's one key uh, tool or one key strategy that is, that is mo more important than any other strategy you can, you can have online in online marketing. And it's more important than you know, your A-B testing and all those other things. And that is that you must be relevant to the audience that's coming to you. You have to establish relevance. You have to be relevant. And if, if, they, if somebody comes to your page or your offering and they don't feel it's relevant, they're gone. So, so that's a simple answer. That's a simple thing, but it's not easy because then the question is, well, how do you be relevant? How do you establish relevance? That's another we could talk about that, um, but it's important to say that you know that's sort of more on the artistic, creative side, being relevant, projecting yourself in a relevant way to who you know your audience is, as opposed to the technical part. They need to blend. Mm -hmm. Right. Did that make sense? Yeah. No. And I'm so glad that you brought up relevance. I mean, that's actually a topic that my partner Ike and I talk about. It's probably got to be every single day that word comes up in our personal lives as we, you know, journey through life. And in, in addition to our business, it, it is so absolutely 100% key to what it's, we're doing. It's more important than any other thing you can do. If you establish relevance in a good way, your website can look like crap and you'll get, you'll get sales because people find it to be relevant. And I've seen it happen. I go to pe my partners and my Colleagues, I go to their websites and go, this looks like something out of the 90s. Why don't you update this? They're like, this works. <laughs> it's relevant. I can prove it to you. And it does mm -hmm. because all those bells and whistles are less important than the, that key thing, establish relevance. I can give you a couple tips on how to establish relevance. Yes, like. let's hear it. Um, so the simple... The simple answer, and I get, get into each of these a little more, the simple answer is there's two things you need to do to establish relevance. Um, the first thing is you need to know who you are. And the second thing is you need to know who your audience is. Okay. Simple, but not easy. Mm -hmm. So the more you know about yourself, the more you can project yourself clearly. And the more you know about your audience who's coming to you, the more you can speak to them in a way that they want to hear. Sounds simple. It is simple, not easy, of course. So how do you do those two things? Um, Really, with audience, uh, there are a lot of methods. Um, behavior, you know, there's behavior targeting, there's um, personality targeting. You know that um, people that come to you could be of a certain personality type. Um, people that tend to go into online marketing uh, uh, offers, um, you know that they're in business or wanting to be in business. So what you can you can make a list of everything you can assume about your visitor just because of the fact that they clicked on something to get to your website, to get to your page, whatever. You can assume, okay, well, they're interested in this. That means if it's an online marketing offer, I'm selling something like a core online marketing course, and somebody clicked to get to it, I know that they're in business somehow, and I know that they're doing an online business somehow, and I know that they're you know, probably 50% to 60% male, because that's the demographic. 
I'm assuming that. That may not always be true. Um, you can find out things, too, through computer technology of, of who you're dealing with. Do they have Apple computers? Are they using a mobile device? These are all things you can discover. Um, the more you know, the better. Even if all you know is that 80% of your audience is, is on a mobile device coming to you, you can, that is such valuable knowledge. You can, say, you can assume a lot of things from that. You can assume, first of all, they're younger. You can assume their age, uh, at least a, a range. You can also speak to them from a, from a standpoint of their mobility, so you know that they care about certain things differently than people who might be visiting you from a desktop device. On and on, we could go on and on, but that's the idea. The idea is that the more you know about your audience, the more you can speak to them. And even if all you know is uh, that you're speaking to certain personality types, you know, the driver, the giver, the, the analytical, and the, and the expressive, these are the four personality types they teach you in sales training, right? If you just speak to those four personality types, you're at least being more relevant, right, to, the, to each of those four. Now, how do you know more about yourself? Um, that's, interestingly, that's often harder for people because <laughs> people think they already know about themselves and they already know about their products and they already know what, what they're trying to say. And um, I can tell you that quite often people um, speak about their products incorrectly, improperly, in a way that doesn't resonate. Um, so it's really important that you get an outside um, expert to give you some feedback on how to language your product to the, those markets and to those kinds of people that you have identified as your audience so that you know you're speaking to you're giving the proper hooks that will hook them in um, that's really not something we do well for ourselves I, I'm an expert on it and I don't do it well for myself I ask my colleagues to give me feedback because I know I'm too close to it it's my own work is harder for me to do that with. I can do it all day long for other people, <laughs> but yep. not for myself. So, um, so I just really would encourage people to make sure they get feedback from somebody who's somewhat knowledgeable uh, on their languaging. Yep, and that's so true. That's such a, a human nature thing to have a difficult time, yes, languaging the copy for our own offer featuring us or something we've created, whether it features, features us or not, then, yeah, helping somebody else, you know, stand out and, you know, see all their strengths and all the stuff that they're offering. So Exactly, and, and the whole point, remember, the whole point of all this, of, of, of defining your audience and projecting yourself is to be, be more relevant. Right. So always use that as your, as your um, sort of test. Like, is this is this making it more relevant for my for my audience? Right. Awesome. Thank you. That's a really really great point, and I'm glad that we got to dive into the the relevant question topic, and it was very relevant for this event. So I appreciate that. Ah, let's see. One of my personality traits is to be kind of a goofball, so I like to be you know kind of corny, funny. But there it is. <laughs> you can use that. That's it. You just did. It. <laughs> there it is. Awesome. So um, switching gears just a little bit, you know, in your work, you talk about there being these four ways of driving traffic and, and how to actually prior, prioritize those ways. Can you dive into a little bit of that? Yeah, sure. Um, this is uh, one, another one of the things people kind of neglect when they take courses online. Um, quite often, the courses are about building their materials, building their product, building their pages building their funnels, and then um, the teachers go, okay, great, good luck, and, and then you kind of go, well, who, how do I get people? <laughs> Where do the people come from? Where do the eyeballs come from? Do I go out to Facebook and try to bring them in? So, so basically, um, I've kind of made a simple way of um, prioritizing traffic driving. There's four, there are exactly four ways to get traffic online. These are simplifications, but they're, it's, it's a real nice way to think about it. And if, if people are out there and you're at a desk and you have a piece of paper in front of you, put four columns on the paper and write down these headings because you're going you're gonna to make notes on this. This is uh, really useful. Um, so there are four ways to drive traffic online, and all of them are legitimate. There's not one that's better than another. There might be one that's better for you than another, but they're all legitimate ways and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. What your job is to look at all four, look at the advantages and disadvantages and say, 
I need to do this one and this one the most because, because of different ideas, the different um, evaluations that I can get into if you like. But the four ways are, um, the first way is, uh, uh, call, is called paid media. You can, pay, you can drive traffic by paying for it. Okay? That means you go to other people's traffic, websites, mailing lists, that make the offer, that have their uh, traffic available for pay, advertising basically, and um, you pay for it. You put an ad on their website, you pay for a mailing list blast, whatever it is. It's paid media, and it's the probably the single most common type of media on the internet. Um, it tends to be used more by companies with a lot of money um, because the, disadvan the, the disadvantage to it is that you need to know uh, your rate, your conversion rates, or you're going to waste money on it because you have to pay for it. So um, after, usually it's used after you establish your conversion rates and you know that your funnel is working, then you can go out and buy media and you know that you're going to make money on it. Um, it's also used by big companies that aren't looking for conversions. They're looking for brand extension. They just want your, they just want their brand in your brain. So, you know, Coca-Cola and all those guys, they're going to use this all the time because they're not trying to get you to buy a Coke right now. They just want you to remember Coke all the time when you go to the market. So paid media tends to be used for, by bigger companies. Um, although, remember, Facebook ads, PPC ads, that's paid media. Pay-per-click is paid media. You're paying Facebook, let's say, to drive traffic your way. Um, so you can do it on a smaller budget. You can test it. You can spend $250 or $500 and test some things and, and get the feedback, and it can be useful. There are people who are expert at that, at doing kind of low-cost test paid media uh, advertising. The second way to drive traffic, by the way, the advantage of paid media is that you, um, once you find your metrics, you can um, scale it as far as you want to go. Uh, so it's never ending, and um, you can also tend. It tends to make you the most money uh, if if you can get the conversions. You don't have to share with anybody. You're not giving a commission to anybody. You make all the money. You just have to pay for the media. So that's paid. The second way is uh, to what's called performance media. It's to share for you for the traffic, which is you, that you pay commission. So you go to a performance network or a performance partner and. Um, they drive traffic to you and you share the revenue with them. It's also called affiliate marketing, right? Online affiliate marketing. Um, there are affiliate networks out there and the joint venture market uh, model that we've been talking about is an affiliate model usually. 90% um, of the time it includes affiliate uh, revenue back and forth. Um, so that's a share model. The, the advantage of that is that it's almost risk-free. You don't have to pay anything until you make something. Um, but generally, you're paying a, a larger percentage. You're paying 40, 50, sometimes 60% out. Um, but the fact that you can do that without any risk makes it a very attractive model, especially for people that are just getting, to, getting it going. Uh, the disadvantage of uh, the performance model is that you have to find partners. You have to find affiliates, and you have no control. You, you can't make them advertise. You can't make them promote you. You have to, you have to cajole and make deals and work work the relationships. Um, it's a whole different ballgame. Uh, with the paid model, you have total control. You're buying the media. You tell them what you want, when you want it, what the demographic is, and that's what you get. So, the third way to drive traffic is to um, share for it, which is called exchange media. That is literally the JV model. Um, it doesn't necessarily always have to include the affiliate model, which is the performance. They tend to go together. So sometimes I just combine those two, the performance model and the share exchange model, because they go together so often. But uh, technically, they're two separate models. You can do an exchange without any commissions. I'll promote you, you promote me. No commissions exchange, just promotion exchange. Um, again, Great, great model. You get the warmest traffic you can possibly get because, you know, you're promoting to your audience that knows and trusts you and you say, hey, go see this guy. He's got a great thing. And so they trust you. So I just benefited from all that trust that you have. Um, 
So I get all these very warm leads over, over here. Great model. Uh, again, the disadvantage is the same is you have to make the relationships and find the partners. And then the last uh, fourth way is um, to work for it, <laughs> which is or what people used to call organic marketing. Uh, it's all the stuff that you do online that um, is like um, putting out articles, uh, po social media posts. It's all the um, social media and organic stuff that you do that you are, you're putting out content and you're hoping people will see it. You generally you put it out on other people's platforms, the bigger the better, and you hope that their platform has traffic that goes to it and that people read your article or your post or they see your comment and they want to come to your site to know more. Great advantage is it's super, super cheap. Um, disadvantages, uh, it's a lot of work for a little, you have to do a lot to get a little back. Um, so there's a lot of time investment. If you, if you have time, if that's one thing you have, a lot of people have time but no money, then organic marketing is a great choice. It's, it's cheap, it's practically free, and um, it's also long tail. Usually those things that you put out there stay there for a long time. Um, not so much for social media, but for like blogging, a guest blogging and things like that, um, there can be a long tail to it. So all four of those traffic methods are valid. The question is, which ones are the right ones for you, right? Do you have a budget? No, then paid media is out, right? Do you have the time and energy to do this, the organic? No, then that's out or, or minimize it, you know, sort of like an EQ. You, this is gonna go down, this one's gonna go up, these, these are my priorities. My, my company, we tend to focus on the joint venture and affiliate, the two in the middle, <laughs> um, because they tend to be the most leveraged for um, people who are still building their mailing lists. Got it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for separating that out into these four, you know, very recognizable, you know, sectors of what we can do in the world of, of marketing. I think that was, that was really great to have that clear vision of all the different options. And yeah, everybody watching right now, there are many ways that you could use, you could use all of them in some way, shape or form, if that was open and a possibility for you financially and with your time and, you know, try some things out and, you know, keep adjusting accordingly. And, and make a, keep those lists in, in those columns. What you should write under each of the four columns is, are, are, are all of the options you have available to you in that column? So paid media, you might say, okay, Google Ad, AdSense or AdWords. Sorry, AdSense is incoming. AdWords is paying. So Google AdWords and Facebook uh, PPC. Uh, and I have a friend who has a website that'll charge me only this much for that. You know, so just write them all down in each of the columns. What do you have available? especially the organic column because there's so much you can do in organic you know you've got your your blog you've got guest blogging you've got social media you've got all the different social medias that one's a big one you'll have a long column of that and so you what you want to do is you want to highlight the ones that make sense for you to do right yeah. awesome thank you i want to yeah. dive quickly um into free gifts for a moment because i know that's obviously a big thing that you do in launch moxie and a great great way to list build and you know joint venture with people so can you talk a little bit about um you know how can the people watching right now make sure that their whatever their free gift offer is how can they make sure that it's that it's working for them absolutely it's um probably the one thing we specialize in the most um after the after defining the joint venture and affiliate marketing channels those two of the four the next most important thing is your free gift, your, your opt-in offer or your opt-in funnel, uh, which is a part of the bigger sales funnel. Um, and it is important. In fact, it's, uh, it's, it's quintessentially important that you do this right. Um, I've seen so many people that have a great free gift, but it's not set up right. It's not that the free gift is not good. It's that it's not set up the right way to lead people to the sale. So it's really important. Um, so I set up a little um, uh, system of four, basically four things to look for to make sure your free gift is working properly. Four criteria. Um, and you should be able to, your free gift should do all four of these things to the best of its, to the best you can. 
If it does three out of the four, scrap it. It's not going to work. It has to do all four of these four, these following things. And then we could talk about what kind of free gifts, but um, it's really important that you lead people. So you're driving this traffic using joint venture and affiliate marketing. They come to your free gift page. And hopefully you know something about them and you've designed that page so that it speaks to them and it projects who you are. So you're being relevant. Now, what you need to do is make sure when they get your free gift, it's going to do the right thing and take them through your funnel. Here are the four things to look for. Um, your free gift, the first thing is your free gift must attract the largest segment, the largest part of your audience as possible, as is reasonable. So, for example, if you're a, if you're a yoga coach and you've got a yoga program, um, you and you have a you decided you want a free gift that is um, yoga for pregnant women. That's a horrible idea because you've just eliminated everybody who's not pregnant from your market. Unless your unless your whole business is yoga for pregnant women, if your business is yoga in general, then that's a bad free gift. It's not attracting the largest segment of your audience. You want to have the largest possible segment of the people that come to you. So that's the first thing. And it should be exciting and enticing. It should be something that attracts them. Um, you know, something maybe surprising, unexpected. This is where the creativity comes in. Um, you know, yo yoga at home, I don't know, yoga for couples, I don't know, um, something. You don't want to limit it too much. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is it needs to deliver some nugget of value. So it must deliver. Um, it can't be pure sales or people will just go, you know, that was a brochure, forget it. So it has to deliver something impressive. People kind of, you want people to walk away going, oh, that was cool. Um, so it has to deliver on the promise that you're making. The promise is in step one. You're, you're offering something of value. You're making a promise. If you get this free gift, you're going to get something. Step two, deliver that something. Step three, the third thing it has to do is it has to not deliver too much. <laughs> this is one area that people miss a lot. They'll over deliver. You have to leave people wanting more. You have to, you have to give them enough that they feel like that's, wow, that was impressive, but I didn't get it all. And I'd like to know more about this person. That's a tricky one. You have to really think about that and think about where to stop. And, and just enough that they're satisfied and they don't feel like you pulled a bait and switch, but not enough that they go, well, that was good enough. I'm, I'm happy. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and then the fourth thing is um, you have to, so the third thing is you have to leave them wanting more. The fourth thing is you have to leave them wanting more of the th right thing. So you have, in other words, you have to point them in the direction you want them to go in. So if your eventual sale is a, a yoga, you know, Ashtanga yoga course, video course, then it wouldn't make sense to have a freebie that is about flow yoga. If you're, if you're selling Ashtanga yoga, right? I'm just making, a, I'm making this up on the spot, but you, you get what I mean. You don't, you don't want to, you don't want your freebie to sell something that you're not leading them to. It has to lead them to where you want them to go. So if, if you're selling, you know, apples, make them want apples through, through the free gift. Mm -hmm. And so your free gift, so use those four things. Is my free gift doing this? Is my free, all four of those things. And is it doing all four really well? If yes, then you've got a great free gift. Awesome. Thank you. Well, that's great. Another four amazing tips and tools <laughs> that we've learned yeah. today. It summer. just turned out to be four again. <laughs> <laughs> the magic number. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much. That's great. Um, and, you know, we're actually coming to the time of the interview where I want to remind everybody there's a, a button below this video or below the audio, depending on if you're watching or listening to this right now. And it actually leads over to a special offer that Chris has for everybody. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so basically, it's, a, it's the, uh, what, we, what I call our author co-op. And we use the term author to mean everything, coach, trainer, author, speaker, you know, teacher, thought leader. <laughs> um, and um, it's called the Author Co-op, which is a, co a co-op network that allows people in the list building phase of their business 
to accelerate that process um, and to do joint venturing uh, without the hassle of having to um, go out and find all the partners and form all the relationships and make all the deals and follow up on all the deals, make sure they do what they say they were going to do and blah, 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 blah. It's a, it's a, uh, and it, it's not instead of all that, you can still do all that too. It's, um, but a lot of people find that to be in, uh, cumbersome, especially in the startup and building phases. So the author co-op is a way to sort of, it's a turnkey place to sort of get joint venturing happening without having to go through all that hassle of setting up the joint ventures. Essentially they're joint venturing with the co-op, which has a big list and we do exchanges and you, you can, you can pick other members of the co-op to promote and then you get promoted back. You can also promote yourself in the co-op and you get promoted back. So the first thing we always tell people is when they join the co-op is the first thing to do is promote your own product your own, or your own offer, your own, your own freebie. It's, it's a freebie network because for everybody you drive to your own freebie, we'll double it. So, um, so that's the first thing. And then, and then get your friends to promote to your freebie and we'll double that. And then, and then once you've done as much of that as you can, when you go out on speaking and you get on the radio, send people to your freebie in the co-op because we'll double all that traffic. We'll match it in, in a, in the joint venture fashion. Um, once that's all played out, then the next thing to do is uh, promote other people, other members of the co-op, members that you like, members that you feel comfortable with, that you think your audience would love. Um, and there's a lot of them in there. There's about 50 or 60 at, at any given time. Um, you'll almost certainly find at least one or two that you like. Some of them are even philanthropic, uh, event-oriented, so they're, there's bound to be a few that, that you'll like for your audience. A lot of people are very hesitant to... I don't want to promote just anything to my audience. They're very careful about their audience. That's fine. Um, be picky, but, but use the joint venture model and select what you think is the best. And then for every uh, click you send, every, all the traffic you send to those offers, we'll double that back to your offer. So it just accelerates the whole process. And you can do as much of it or as little of it as you want. Mm. And there's one more thing that uh, is, is really exciting that um, that people can use in the co-op. And that is, if you have a partner, if you have a joint venture partner that would be willing to promote you and your freebie, but you're not big enough to promote them back, so, that, so a joint venture between you two doesn't work. Let's say you have 5,000 in your mailing list and they have 50,000. And they go, yeah, but you know, it would take you 10 promotions to match what we're gonna do for you. So you haven't been able to make a JV, a joint venture work. You can bring that partner to us. And if we approve them, we'll promote them on your behalf. Mm. They promote your offer in the network. We promote them in return. You get the traffic. Oh, that's awesome. So it allows you to do a joint venture with partners way beyond your size by using us as a, as the, um, uh, as the, as the JV uh, reciprocation. And that's something we only do for our members. It's, it's a member privilege. It costs nothing. There's a one-time membership fee. And then those are uh, the privileges that you get. Mm. Oh my God. I love it. Well, two things keep coming to my mind as you're talking about this. So number one is scalability because clearly you're create, you've created something where there's multiple different ways that you can scale your business by being a part of this you know, community and all the different ways that can work. And then secondly, just the community, because I feel like one thing that like a theme that's been coming up throughout this event is a lot of people feel in, if they're entrepreneurs, like they're on an Island all by themselves, right? Like we're, we live in this age of we can run a business from home and yet then we're not like interacting with people as much and to be able to have, we have much more digital relationships or being able to be on zoom right now and, you know, interact with everybody in that way. But to scale that out and, and create yourself a really amazing community of people that you have each other's backs and all you can, you know, create all these creative ways of, of supporting one, one another. I think that's so key, especially where we are right now in, in the world of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, community is, is essential. And, um, and, and just having a network, you know, at, at your, you know, available to you, um, to look at, to study, to share with. Uh, a lot of it is it comes down to just having 
the ability to see things that are working, like to study them and, um, and copy and model things that are working. So that, that's really great too. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you again for that great, great offer. And everybody, again, a ri reminder that that button is right beneath this video or the audio, depending on if you're watching or listening, and you can click right through on it to go over to Chris's site. Um, Chris, are there any last insights, tools, tips, any four, four more amazing things you want to <laughs> share with us today before we hop off? <laughs> Let me look at my notes here, see if there's anything else. Um, oh, there's tons. I could go on and on. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we do, for example, um, when we look at uh, people who join as members of the co-op is, um, is we go through that getting, uh, that getting to know yourself and getting to know your audience uh, process. We call it a sort of assessment, uh, self-assessment process. And um, we have a little inventory uh, process that we go through to inventory who you are, uh, not personally, but professionally, who, who your business is and, and what you have available to you and what you don't have available to you. One of the things people kind of miss is they, um, they don't remember when they take a course from a guru marketer, they forget that their, their situation is different than that person's situation all, in all sorts of ways. One financially, that person may have a lot more money than you have to invest in something. Uh, Creativity, maybe that person is super creative. Maybe that person is super knowledgeable of technology and you're not. Um, on and on and on. There's a lot of differences. And, and so taking a little assessment and inventory of what you do have and what you don't have is really beneficial. So we do that as part of the membership thing. Um, usually, usually by phone as part of the uh, initial call that we have, but it's, it's kind of uh, useful for people to sort of look at their business and say, okay, these are my strengths. I have, you know, good technology and I have this and I have that. I have great content on this and blah, 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 blah. I have an audience over here. These are my weaknesses. I don't have much money to invest. I don't have, you know, and you just list them out and, and be honest about what you have and what you don't have so you can really make good decisions. Hmm. Love it. That's my final word. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate you being here with us today. And it's been great to, to reconnect with you. And thanks for all that you're up to in the world. Thank you, Mandy. Good to, good to be here. I'm looking forward to, to watching the rest of your guests on the show, too. <laughs> <laughs> me, me, too. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. That is a wrap. And let's build a fortune together. Mm -hmm.